Good morning again. <laughs> Sitting in on the Sunday school class this morning and then after singing uh, those songs in worship, in some ways I feel like the sermon has already been preached, but I suppose I will proceed. Uh, <clears throat> would you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to God's word? Holy Father, we... Uh, come here this morning to you, and we are coming to you, the perfect cornerstone, the firm foundation, the solid rock, having absolutely nothing to boast in, in and of ourselves. God, we come here to op offer sacrifices acceptable to you, and yet we have nothing to offer apart from your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, I need you desperately to come this morning and bring your word. And I pray that you would do so. God, I pray that it would build us up, that it would convict us, that it would cause us to rest even more in your Son as the one and that holds us all up and that holds us all together. God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our passage this morning, we are continuing on <clears throat> in the first epistle of Peter. So 1 Peter chapter 2. And this morning will be in verses 4 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 8. And in your church, if you're using the Pew Bible, that's on page uh, 1014 and 1015. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. <clears throat> Let me read that now. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Well, I want to start this morning by paying a compliment to Nebraskans, hardworking Nebraskans. And especially to those of you who may be in the construction business. When I first came here about five years ago, uh, the first thing we did was uh, a house hunting trip. And uh, some of you may know my structural engineer father-in-law. He may have given you some tips from time to time. Um, and he was along with us on this journey, which was very helpful. One of the first things that he pointed out was how impressed he was with the well-built homes in this state and the solid and strong foundations that we have here in Nebraska. You see, in Oklahoma, our houses are not so well built. Um, growing up in my house, we had a fault line that ran the entire length of the foundation, wreaking havoc on any furniture, fixtures, or walls that happened to get in the way. And... Uh, if any of you here were unfamiliar with uh, the geographic location of the Marianas Trench, I found that in my in-law's garage <laughs> when I started dating Erica. 
faulty foundations and leading to failing houses. And in Genesis chapter 11, we have an account of a a different type of faulty foundation. In Genesis chapter 11, Moses records this account for us of the Tower of Babel. Many of you are familiar with that story. Where our people set out and said, Come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Come let us make a name for ourselves. Their foundation was on human strength. Their foundation was on their own human ability and intellect. And many of you will know the rest of the story. God came down to put a halt to that building project built on the wrong foundation and he dispersed them throughout all the land. A people who were trying to avoid in the first place being pulled apart and being dispersed. Faulty foundations lead to failing houses. Whether it's spiritual, a faulty spiritual foundation or a faulty physical foundation. But you know, this morning as we come to this passage, we are coming to God's house. And God's house has for its foundation the one sure, the one firm, the one unfailing foundation who is Jesus Christ. And this is the house that we come to this morning in our text in 1 Peter. We are founded upon him. We are built upon him, resting upon him, held together by him, joined together because his life is in us, held together by him and submitting under him. As Colossians 1.17 says, in him all things hold together. This is our foundation. And as we look at this text this morning, what I want to show is that God's purpose and God's design for his house is a people who rests solely on this firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And you can write this down in your notes. God's purpose and design for his house is a people who rest solely on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. So as we consider God's house this morning, I want to take a look at four key components of God's house. Number one being the firm foundation that we are built on. Jesus Christ, the perfect cornerstone. The foundation. Number two, the superstructure. So, what is the makeup, the materials of this house? Living stones held together by Christ. Number three, what is the function of this house? The regular activity of this house that God is building among his people. And then finally, what is the ultimate purpose of God's house? God's purpose and design for his house is a people who rest solely on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at that foundation this morning. Starting in verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now the first thing to say here is that This passage begins with, as you come to him. This is not actually a new thought, but if you were to go back and look at this, in the original language, you would see that it's coming on the heels of what John preached last week. So it would say something like this, going back to verse 2. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Coming to him, or coming to whom, you are being built up. You, like, are coming to him, a living stone rejected by men in the sight of God, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves are being built up into a spiritual house. So coming to this person whom you are longing for, like an infant longs for spiritual, for milk, longing for him, tasting and seeing that he is good, now you are coming to him. So a lot of us, when we hear, what does it mean to come to Christ? As you come to him, we think of our initial salvation experience. And it's common for us to ask the question, well, when did you come to Christ? And that's a perfectly good question to ask. And that would certainly be in mind here in this text. But even more so, this has in mind that daily moment, 
by moment coming to Christ. So as you are coming to Christ in His Word, as you are coming to Christ in prayer, as you are coming to Christ in the gathering of His people, you yourselves are being built up into a spiritual house. We must come constantly, daily, to this foundation who is Jesus Christ. Secondly, why a stone? (coughs) Why is he referred to as a cornerstone? Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Down in verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Why a stone? Why a cornerstone? Why a rock? And we just sang this song, On Christ the solid rock I stand. Well, we are in Peter's letter. And if there was anybody more aptly placed to be talking about Jesus as a rock, as a foundation, it would be Peter. And I believe John mentioned this last week. Peter was the one, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? It was Peter, actually Simon at the time, who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, right after that confession, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Meaning, you are the rock. Your name will be rock because you represent all those from here out who will confess that Jesus is the Christ. The church is built upon that foundation of people who confess Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the foundation of the church. Yes, Peter represents that through his confession. But Peter is repeating to us here that it is Jesus who is the rock. This church, the whole universal church is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And then finally on this point of the foundation, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You see, he was rejected by men because when they had in mind a cornerstone, when the Israelites had this in mind, When they were thinking of Messiah, it was a political leader who would come back and restore Israel to all of its glory as they knew it through the rebuilding of a temple because the temple represented the dwelling place of God among men. And so when the suffering servant Jesus came into this world, though he was chosen before the foundation of the world and precious in the sight of God, they missed it. They couldn't see it because he came in humility. He came as one who was ready to serve. He came as one who came to die. Their Messiah would not be somebody who would be trampled on by men, spit on by men, and then only come to die. And yet we know Jesus is God dwelling among men. Jesus is the temple in that sense. Jesus is chosen and precious in the sight of God. The only one who God has ever been able to look at and say, this is the one in whom I am well pleased. Did you know that? He can't look on me apart from Christ and say, in you I am well pleased. He can't look on any of us. Colossians 1.19 says, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Our foundation is, we are built on the foundation of the only one in whom God has ever been pleased to dwell. This is our foundation, Jesus Christ. The second point this morning is, that we're going to look at is the superstructure of the house. So we're built on the foundation of Christ, but the superstructure of God's church is fellow living stones held together by Christ. On the foundation of Christ and now held together by Christ. Living stones, if ever there was a paradox. 
Living sacrifices, another example. How would the original audience, hearing these phrases for the first time, how, will they, how would they have processed a living stone? I like to call these things in the Bible, living dead things. If there's anything we know about a stone or a rock, is that it's as dead as dead can be. And yet, we know that we serve a God who delights in giving life to dead things. Giving life to dead people. How many of you who are here this, mor- or who are here this morning were once dead? And if you were not once dead, then perhaps you are still dead. And yet it is our God who delights in bringing life to dead men. Colossians 3, 4 says, For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. The church of God, the superstructure of God, because we all have been given life in Christ, is comprised of the formerly dead. And we rejoice now in the fact that we are living stones, not because of anything that we did, but because of the resurrection power that brought life to Christ when he died on the cross, being transferred and being given to us. And as ambassadors of Christ and those being joined together by the life of Christ, it is our privilege to bring the message of life to dead things, to dead stones scattered about with no foundation. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, concerning our former life and our new life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The only reason that we are the church, that we are able to rest on this foundation that we have become living stones and the reason that we are held together is because of a common life we have in Christ. Because Christ is our life. And then further concerning this superstructure, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, meaning God's word as we know it today, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Not only... Are we made living stones because of Christ's life in us? But because we are being built together as living stones, we come here today with the same common purpose. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to do this life on our own? Isn't it wonderful when I feel like the stone that is starting to get wobbly, someone else who has Christ in them comes alongside me pressing up against me with the strength of Christ? What is Lone Ranger Christianity? (laughs) That if ever there was an oxymoron, you can't do church alone. You need the other living stones to come alongside you and hold you up. Other living stones who are also resting on that foundation of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're all pulled apart. We're all scattered about. We're all looking for a foundation as the people were building the Tower of Babel. So we rest on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. We are held together by Christ in the superstructure. And then number three, the function of God's house. The function of God's house or the regular activity of God's house is priestly service to God. And I take this 
from verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. The function of God's house is priestly service to God. And I realize this one will need some explanation, some unpacking, because that's kind of a foreign way to think of ourselves, I think especially today, as those who are set apart for priestly service to God. Didn't the priests go away in the Old Testament, after the Old Testament when Christ died on the cross? Isn't that all in the past? And we're not Catholics, so we're not thinking of priests in that term. There's no specific New Testament office for a priest, apart from everyone who is a believer is a priest. So what does it mean to offer priestly service to God? I think the best way that we can explain this this morning would be to consider the priesthood of the Old Testament and to consider the characteristics and qualities of those priests. So I have five qualities of a priest that I want to share with you that we take from the Old Testament. Though we don't have time to cover every verse or scriptural basis for these, this is how a priest functioned, or this is who a priest was in the Old Testament. And write these down if you're taking notes. Number one, a priest was chosen by God apart from any merit of his own. The priests of the Old Testament belonged to one specific tribe. That was the tribe of Levi. And there was absolutely nothing deserving of the tribe of Levi. In fact, you could probably argue even the opposite. And yet they were a tribe selected, elected, chosen by God to perform the duties in the temple, to perform priestly service to God. Number two, a priest was someone who was cleansed before offering service. For a priest to come into the tabernacle, into the temple, to offer a sacrifice with uncleanness on his hands was an offense of the greatest type. A priest had to be cleansed. He had to wash himself of any uncleanliness before entering into the temple, the tabernacle. Number three, priests were clothed in special garments. The priests wore special garments that set them apart as priests so that others would know that they were priests so that they could be consecrated unto God. Number four, priests were submitted to God's word. And if they weren't submitted to God's word and if they failed at even the slightest point of the prescriptions that were given to them on how to offer sacrifices, they could be killed. They were killed. We have stories like that in the Old Testament. Priests were submitted to God's word. Number five, priests were intercessors on behalf of God's people. This was the priestly service of the Old Testament carried out by the tribe of Levi. But then what happened? We read about this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 through 25. The priests had to go into the tabernacle constantly to atone for the sins of the people through sacrifices. It says in Hebrews 9, chapter 22, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so continual sacrifice was required until the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, once and for all sacrifice, entered in to the Holy of Holies on our behalf once and for all. And that was Jesus Christ, who we now refer to as our great high priest. And it says this in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that's Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. 
Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And that is how the priesthood of the Old Testament was changed forever. It was through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And now we are priests in the sense that we can enter directly into the presence of God. We can boldly approach the throne of grace, but only on account of Jesus Christ. Our foundation is in Christ. We're being held together by Christ. And we're only able to offer any type of service to God on account of what Christ has done. So let's come back to these five qualities of the priesthood. Number one, we have been chosen by God apart from no merit of our own. Just like the priests in the tribe of Levi. Nothing we can do to deserve God's grace and mercy. And yet he has chosen us to be living stones. <coughs> Number two. We are a cleansed people. Because we have been washed by the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number three. We have been clothed with Special garments. I love this. I get goosebumps thinking about it. We have been clothed with robes of righteousness and garments of salvation. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with, jewel, with her jewels. We have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and that is how we are able to boldly approach the throne of grace. That's the only reason we're able to come to God in prayer. Bobby taught that this morning. Apart from the righteousness of Christ, we have nothing to offer God, but we've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Number four, we are able to submit to God's word because we have the ready access to God's word. And as God's people, we are a people of the book. And as God's people, we are to obediently be submitting to his word. And number five, just as the priests of old inter had the ability to intercede on the behalf of their people, we have the privilege to come to God in prayer on behalf of Christ, on account of Christ, and intercede for each other. And also to plead for mercy for those who do not yet know him. This is our privilege. We wear the garments of salvation. We get to intercede. We get to come directly before God, all because of Christ. Now I know when I first uh, was commissioned for special service in the United States Navy. It was a pretty cool thing. I'm not going to lie. And I got to wear a pretty awesome uniform. It's called Summer Whites. You may have seen it on Top Gun. <laughs> that was a special uniform that I got to wear that set me apart for service to my country. I remember coming home on leave back to my home in Oklahoma and showing up to church in my uniform. Now, that just seems nerdy now, but I was so proud to wear those summer whites because it meant that I was a part of something much bigger than myself. I got to tell people about cool things that other people didn't get to experience. I got to fly in helicopters and ride on submarines and do cool stuff like that. I went to New York City in summer whites and everything was free. I'm not joking. Everything was free. Some of you may have experienced that. And yet I think how much more to be able to walk into my office on Tuesday morning wearing the robes of the righteousness of Christ. Now don't confuse this with self-righteousness because that's a big problem that we get into sometimes in our evangelism with coworkers is people think we're self-righteous. But they need to see that we are every bit as broken 
as they are apart from Christ. We need to put on that uniform, wear it into our offices. Moms, when you wake up in the morning, wear the robes of righteousness and impart that life-giving message to your kids. What I, it's one thing I love about preaching and I love about just chewing on, one of, uh, on God's word for a, a long time is that it calls you out of the world. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by that? It just grips you and it thrusts you out of this, I'm going to work nine to five and I'm going to get this done and then I'm going to go home and I have to put food on the table and then I'm going to go to sleep and get up and do it all over again. And then God's word just says, no. You're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You're set apart for priestly service. This is what you get to do. This is the privilege. Coming to God in prayer. Interceding on behalf of a brother or sister. Going over to, to people's houses and helping them repair things and fix things and, and bringing life to those dead things. We get to demonstrate the life. We get to demonstrate the righteousness of Christ. We get to demonstrate what he did for us on the cross to everyone. This is special service. This is priestly service unto God. And that's the regular activity of God's house. I'm sorry to get so excited. And that moves us to the final point, and it's very closely related. And that is, what are we doing as priests? The ultimate purpose of God's house is to offer acceptable sacrifices to God. Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Acceptable worship. What is a spiritual sacrifice? What are living sacrifices? How do we offer anything acceptable to God? If you haven't figured out by now, this sermon is all about Christ. There's nothing acceptable that we have to bring before God apart from our full trust in Christ. I know it's Father's Day, and some of you maybe were hoping for a Father's Day message. I talked about my father-in-law at the beginning. I'll talk about my father now. Uh, my earthly father, many of you know, is somebody who I hold uh, in great esteem. Somebody who I could even say is, is a hero in some senses. Um, I have been privileged to be the son of somebody who is a, a God-fearing man, who preaches God's word, who teaches God's word, who counsels people to submit to God's word who shared the gospel with me when I was eight years old in the kitchen. And to this day, I'm not afraid to say that it is a joy for me to feel the approval and to feel the acceptance of my father, to know what is pleasing to him and to know in some way that he delights in me. I know that can sound kind of self-centered, but there's this, there's this joy that we have in in being able to obey or being able to honor a good father or a good boss. And I want to know what pleases my dad. I, want to, I, I talked to him just this week for an hour and a half, just asking questions, asking for advice, and listening to him tell me. And then I think we're supposed to offer these acceptable sacrifices to God. How much more should we desire to please God? And you know, it's not in trying harder. I think we've kind of figured that out up to this point. It's not in trying to be a better person. You know, the only thing, like I said, that we could ever offer God is that which exalts his son. That which puts our life on hold, that lays our life aside. We have died, right? We've died to ourselves. And it's Christ who now lives and it's that continual putting on display Christ. That is the spiritual sacrifice. That is the dying. And I want to just give you a few examples this morning of some of those spiritual sacrifices. Let's say at work you're, uh, you are 
wronged, or maybe by a brother or sister, you have been wronged, you have been hurt, you have been insulted, maybe you've been trampled on. Maybe someone within this church, maybe a family member. And though you feel like you have every right to get even with them, you have every right to respond to them with anger or to respond to them with an insult of an equal level, you lay your life aside and you say, no, this is an opportunity where I get to show what the grace and mercy that Christ showed to me even while I was a reckless, rebellious, dead, disobedient sinner. And so you lay your life aside and you exalt Christ and you put him on display. That is a spiritual sacrifice. Hebrews 13.50 says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are not, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Maybe you work in a hostile work environment where sharing the gospel publicly or to, to speak of the name of Christ would be of great embarrassment or even worse, public ridicule, damage to your reputation, or even worse, the loss of your job. And yet you remember Hebrews thirteen fifteen, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name and you lay aside your pride, you lay aside that feeling of embarrassment and you play, proclaim Christ to a co-worker who does not yet know him. That is a spiritual sacrifice. One more this morning that I think of often, probably not as often as I should. Maybe you are the mom who comes to church Sunday morning after Sunday morning to join together in worship with those living stones and yet you don't spend any time inside the worship center because you're busy chasing the kids around, changing diapers, disciplining your children, and yet realizing that God has gifted even you to be a part of this body for a very special reason, to build up this body. You lay your own life aside and you continue day after day, week after week, to offer your body as a living sacrifice so that others may be built up. I mean, there's probably no greater time in a woman's life. I've never been a woman, I don't know. But there's probably no greater time in a woman's life to understand herself as a living sacrifice than in this, whatever you want to call it, life is circumstance of children running all over the place and feeling distracted by everything. And yet you lay your, you lay your life down. And I commend you mothers. I could never do it. I've tried staying at home with just my kids for a couple hours and I, it drives me crazy. <laughs> but that's a spiritual sacrifice because you're laying your life aside so that Christ may be exalted. You're recognizing that it's not just you that needs to be here to get something out of the service. You realize that other people are being built up. There's another mother. There's another person who it's like climbing Mount Everest to get to church because of an illness. And she looks at you with four children and says, if she can do it, then I can do it, and I want to be part of this body, and I want to rejoice with her. A spiritual sacrifice. Well, let me conclude. We have talked about God's house this morning. We started with the foundation, who is Jesus Christ. We looked at the superstructure, living stones, made living stones because of Christ, and held together because of our life in Christ. <coughs> our function, our regular activity, being priestly service unto God only because of the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And finally, our ultimate purpose, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. God's design and purpose for his house is a people who rest solely 
on the foundation, the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. This morning I started out referencing the Tower of Babel. A people who had a completely faulty foundation because it was built by man on the strength of man for man. God came down, put the project to a halt, dispersed them. Scattered stones everywhere. And yet, the house that God is building has a foundation that will never fail us. God is building this house even now. God is calling a people out of this world even now to come to the perfect cornerstone. To come and to put their life in the hands of Christ. To rest on that foundation. To be a living stone joined and held together by him. Do you want to be that? Or do you want to be that scattered, dead stone? Life a mess. No foundation. If you have never come to Christ. If you have never come to the cornerstone in the first place. God is calling his people, come. And if you have come to that cornerstone, and if you have found rest in him, and you know what a joy it is to be a part of his house, joined together by him, then I want to plead with you, and I want to plead with me equally this morning. Never stop coming. Come to him in prayer Come to him in his word. Come to him by joining together with his people. My plea this morning for everyone here, would you come to Christ? Let's pray. God, we love your word because it calls us out, rips us out of this world and puts our focus back on what is most important. God, we acknowledge that apart from your Son, we have nothing to offer. Remind us of that daily. When we sin and we want to wallow in our shame, remind us that we have an advocate who we get to come to. Your Son, the perfect, firm foundation, the cornerstone, the rock upon which this church is built. Help us to find our rest in that foundation this morning. God, we pray all of these things in the name of the solid rock, in the name of the cornerstone, the living stone rejected by men, Jesus Christ. Amen. How marvelous, how-